is one of my Christmas is one of my favorite times of year. Um, I know it's February. We're not supposed to talk about Christmas again until right before Thanksgiving, so everybody can say about how we shouldn't talk about Christmas is after Thanksgiving. But <laughs> um, there's there's something I really like about Christmas time. And that's, there's there's this movie that was made from this book, and it's called A Christmas Carol. And one of the versions, in my opinion, the best version, and if you don't agree with me, you're wrong. Uh, the Muppets Christmas Carol. That one is the best. Like, okay, just everything about it is the best. I mean, uh, let, I could make a list, but it really is it, it's the best version. And I saw somebody said no. Was that you, Lauren? No. No? Okay. Well, whoever said that, you're wrong. It is the best. Like, it's pretty good. And one of the things that, that gets me every single year is, um, uh, uh, what's his name? The, the little the little kid with the, the Tim, Timmy? Tiny Tim. Tiny Tim. Tiny Tim's dad says on, on this part, he says, life is full of meetings and partings, and that's just the way of it. And, you know, I wasn't even going to talk about this, and I want to talk about something else, and I just really felt like, I should talk about Ruth and, 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 and dealing with loss. And I was like, well, that's a bummer. I don't want to talk about that. I want to talk about something fun and exciting. I only get one night every, every month. I want that one night to be awesome. I don't want to be depressing. That's terrible. But yet, you know, God kept leading me back to this. And then as if a final sign of approval, pastor talks this morning. <laughs> Do you guys remember what he talked about this morning? What was the name of it? Um, you told us in the office. Uh, who sinned? Who sinned? Yeah, who sinned? Uh, it just was a perfect little confirmation to me about this. So we're going to talk to tonight about dealing with loss, uh, specifically out of the Book of Ruth, because um, you know life is filled with meetings and partings, yes. and uh, it might not seem fair to us, but that's the way life works this side of heaven. We don't have to like it, but that's just the way it is. And you know, if you, if you pay attention, you kind of lose a little bit every every day, right? You lose a little bit here and there, things we don't really think about, right? We lose our keys, we lose our hair, we lose our good looks, little things, you know? I think that, that they add up over time, it doesn't seem that big, but then every once in a while, life just seems to grab a bunch of something we really like and just yank it out of our hands all at the same time. Or death of a loved one, for instance. And it just seems so overwhelming, so crushing, that we can't ever... ever imagine... going on. And... So we'll look at Ruth chapter 1. Ruth chapter 1, verse 1. Now, it came about in the days when the judges governed, so that's before Israel had a king. So sometime in between Joshua leading them into the promised land of the book of Joshua, and before King Saul being elected, or whatever. <laughs> elected, I said. Uh, in First Samuel. So somewhere in that gap there. <coughs> That there was a famine in the land. Now, back then, the famines weren't like today, where, well, it's okay, we'll just stock up on stuff from Walmart. No, 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 if there's a famine, there's nothing to stock up on. Because <laughs> you had to manage your crops where you'd carry enough over from the previous year to have something to plant. But then you'd also have to, you know, eat. So you couldn't keep all of that back, and so you had to prepare all this. And Israel had it a little more complicated because they also had to tithe from their grain. So... It made it a lot more complicated because there was something else they had to factor into it. So they had this whole process here. Um, it makes me wonder in the book of Exodus, uh, Genesis where uh, Joseph has to ration out the food. Like, how nasty was that food tasting by the end of those seven years? Like, uh, yeah. Right? And they were all going to Egypt to buy the food. Like, uh, do you have anything fresher? <laughs> um, okay, and a certain man of Bethlehem and Judah went to sojourn in the land. Uh, land of Moab with, uh, with his wife and his two sons. Okay, so right off we have inter characters introduced. 
What is the book named? Ruth, right? Were any of those people Ruth? No, not yet. Let's hold on. The name of the man was Elimelech, and the name, I say that a hundred times really fast, Elimelech, Elimelech, Elimelech. Uh, and the names of his two sons were Malon and Killian. <coughs> Somebody needs to learn how to name something a little bit funner, right? Uh, Ephrathites of Bethlehem and Judah. Now they entered the land of Moab and remained there. Now, just so you know, the promised land isn't Moab. Moab is over there. They're leaving the promised land to go to not the promised land. Okay. Um, then Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died. And she was left with her two sons. Well, okay. So the main person that was first introduced has already died, and we're, already, we're only in verse 3. Well, things aren't looking good, right? Verse 4, they took for themselves Moabite women as wives. Oh, there's another no-no. The name of the one was Orpah. I always think of uh, those, those, what are those wells called? Um, Orca. Orca. I always think of Orca wells. Orpa. And, um, and the name of the other Ruth. And they lived there about 10 years. Then, then, about, then both Malon and Killian also died, and the woman was bereft of her two children and her husband. Okay, so she's not in her land of birth. Her husband has died, and her children have died. Things are just really not looking great. And they married Moabite women, the foreigners. Her. <laughs> then she arose with her daughters in, daughters-in-law. And I, I always think it's daughter-in-laws, but it's daughters-in-law, and that throws me off. That she might return from the land of Moab, for she had heard in the land of Moab that the Lord had visited his people and giving them food. Did you notice how many times it says Moab? Notice that, as we're reading, okay? So she departed from the place where she was, and her two daughters-in-law with her, and they went on the way to return to the land of Judah. And Naomi said to her daughters-in-law, Go return each of you to her mother, to your mother, uh, to... <laughs> Each of you to her mother's house. May the Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead and with me. May the Lord grant that you may find rest, each in the house of her husband. Then she kissed them, and they left, and they lifted up their voices and wept. And they said to her, No, but we will surely return with you to your people. But Naomi said, Return, my daughters. Why should you go with me? Have I yet sons in my womb that they may be your husbands? Which is creepy if you think about it. <laughs> uh, return, my daughters. Go, for I am too old to have a husband. If I, if I said I have hope, if I should even have a husband tonight, and also bear sons, would you therefore wait until they were grown? Would you therefore refrain from marrying? No, my daughters, for it is harder for me than for you, for the hand of the Lord has gone forth against me. Verse 14, And they lifted up their voices and wept again, and Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to her. So Orpah goes back and Ruth stays with her. So right off we have the... the Seemingly the main character of the book, the book is named for her, Ruth, who's actually a Moabite woman. She's not even a Jew. Which means, by extension, that she really doesn't have that much, you know, for promises because, you know, I mean, the law gave stuff about foreigners and about, you know, sojourners and, and, and pointed towards the day of them being united in. But ultimately, the Jews were the God's people, not the other people. And so we have this little bit of a conf- conflict right now. But with all that, there is still something that needs to be noted. Ruth isn't the only main character of the book. The, the first main character of the book is actually Naomi. The story both starts and ends with Naomi, not with Ruth. Right. And then um, there's another main character. His name's Boaz, but we're not going to look at him today. You know, everything's always about the men in the story, so we're just going to focus on Naomi and let the chips fall where they may. Um, so here we have Naomi, who has really no direction in life, right? She's following her husband because she's expected to, not because she wants to necessarily. What's there to do in Moab? It's uh, a whole lot of rocks, and that's pretty much it. I don't know if you guys have ever seen pictures of what used to be Moab, but it's pretty much just a bunch of rocks. I mean, it's, that's it. Like, that's it. So she, here she is uh, with her husband in this other land. And God's promises, and they're completely unfulfilled, right? So, so God, you brought us out of slavery in Egypt to bring us here. 
where there's a famine and I have to go to ugly old Moab. Not really doing anything. Here we are just existing. Just here. But it gets worse because she was also spiritually lacking. Now we know that in the times of the, of the judges, the spiritual atmosphere was pretty, pretty rough. People were kind of doing whatever they wanted, whenever they wanted. So we have spiritually, not a whole lot's going on. God's not talking to her. God didn't tell her why this was happening. God didn't tell her that it would happen. But it gets worse. She also doesn't have food or money. Here she is, left with pretty much nothing to her name, because she doesn't ever have her husband anymore either. Um, but it gets worse. <laughs> Because the land that was promised to her ancestors, she's no longer in. But it gets worse. She now has no inheritance. Because how it worked was your children, you, you would pass down your inheritance through your family line. But if you had no sons, it went to your nearest relative. So now she's in a worse situation than she was before. Because her sons married Moabite women, not Jewish women. And she was unable to produce any more because of not only her advanced age, but because of nobody to impregnate her. So we have all these problems going on. So there's nothing left to her name. And, but wait, there's more! <laughs> you see, um, back then, if your husband and your children were to die, you were kind of looked down on by the entire society. In other words, it was something along the lines of this. What did you do wrong that God would take not just your husband, but also your kids from you? You must be a sinner. And the entire community, because Israelite community was very fellowship, very communal. And it's not like our communities nowadays where, you know, there's, you know, it, it's, everybody's connected. Okay, that's how Israel worked. Israel worked back then. And so here they are looking down at her because she's, she has nothing to her name. So Naomi literally has everything going against her. Have you ever been in a place where things aren't just bad at work, they're also bad at home, at the church, at work? I mean, everywhere you turn, in every single area of your life, it seems like you're getting crapped on. Have you ever had something like that happen? I have. And that's exactly what Naomi is experiencing here. Literally, nothing could go more wrong than it already was. She was pretty much just waiting to die so that her, her inheritance would go on to some other person who wasn't hers. Mm -hmm. And she had to live the rest of her life knowing that her children had tasted death before her. That is some rough living. Jeez. And so then we get down to verse 19, and look what she says. So they both went until they came to Bethlehem, which is the city that she can't come from. or It's more of a town. And when they had come to Bethlehem, all the city was stirred because of them. And the women said, is this Naomi? Now, Naomi means pleasant. It means sweet. Mm. Like, um, you would say, you know, like, uh, the, like kind of think of the, the, the taste of an apple. You know, it's, it's, it's pleasant. It's a sweet taste, right? Verse 20, she said to them, do not call me Naomi. Don't call me sweet. Don't call me pleasant. Call me Mara. Now, Mara means bitter. Have you ever tasted something that's real bitter? <laughs> At least that, that taste in your mouth? That's Mara. Call me Mara, for the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. The second time, God still hasn't answered her, and she's still saying, God is personally attacking me. You guys go ahead and be free of it, because God is clearly set apart to destroy me. So to some degree, she's even believing what the entire community is, is, is saying about her, that she's just this no good... See what I mean? Okay, but wait, there's more. <laughs> Things just can't get worse for this woman, can it? Um, I already said that, so I'm not going to say it again. Um, okay, but there are three different things that I really want to focus on that the book of Ruth shows us with Naomi, with dealing with loss. Because like, like I said, she was suffering loss in every realm of her life. Spiritual, physical, mental, I mean, the, this is rough. Losing a loved one is, is rough. When you're losing a loved one, at the same time you're losing another loved one and another loved one in a foreign land with no nothing to your name, I mean, it's just like, okay, God, I get it, back off. Let me have some breathing room so I can go and die in peace. 
You know what I mean? Have you ever been in that place where it's just like, things cannot get worse, God? Well, that's exactly what we're looking at here. So three very clear things, I think, that the book of Ruth shows us with Naomi. The first, don't forget or overlook the blessings. See, Naomi didn't lose everything. She had Ruth. In fact, Ruth was to her, well, I'll wait to read that till the end, but Ruth was like, was like a child to her. True, she can't hand the inheritance off to Ruth, but at least she had companionship of some kind. Now, Orpah did leave. There's nothing wrong with that. You know, she went back to Moab. She's a Moabite. But Ruth, for whatever reason, decided to give up all that belonged to her, her homeland, for the sake of comforting this older woman who had lost everything. See, th this, was, this, was, this was a good thing Ruth did. And Naomi didn't lose everything. She still had Ruth, who watched out for her and, for, and who cared for her. Also, she, was, she went back to the promised land. So she was back home. Because she didn't just go back to Israel, she went back to Bethlehem, the place that she had come from. So she was back home. Have you ever been, ever been away from your home for an extended period of time that you get back and it's like, ah, oh, it's good to be home. Well, this is 10 years and all kinds of crappy things happen out in Moab, so it's good to be home. <laughs> um, and then, uh, you know, sometimes when you're really depressed, a new, a new scenery is just, it just relaxes you, you know what I mean? So here she is going back, but she doesn't get out of the fire. She gets from, what's it called, the frying pan into the fire. <laughs> um, but however, there is, she also has food here. Um, as it says in chapter 2, Ruth goes out to different fields and, and picks up food. And as a result, her and Naomi, they have something to eat. See, so, so not everything's bad. She still has someone by her side. She still has... My thing just went off, buddy. I'll use this other one, okay? It lost the connection. I don't know why. Oh, this one lost the connection, too. What do you want me to do? Speak louder. Get that one. <laughs> you want me to use, use the corded? Corded? It's Diana's. I'm going to spit all over it. <laughs> We're good. All right. I don't know. What did I say? Um, I said a lot of things. Um, okay, so not everything was bad. She had a lot of good things going on. Maybe sometimes in life it seems like there's more bad things than good things going on, but there was still something going on. Don't overlook the blessings. The second thing is don't give up. Don't give up. When you're dealing with the midst, midst of loss, yes, it sucks. Nobody is denying that it sucks. But you can't give up. You keep going. Because giving in and giving up doesn't achieve anything. You already lost. Why waste your time grieving about the loss? Now, I'm not saying don't go through the processes of grieving. You have to. That's something that's uncomfortable. You have to do it. And running from it just makes it all the harder. But that doesn't mean that you have to just cave in on yourself and buckle and say, I'm, it's not even worth living. That's always a reason to keep living. It's always a reason to keep living. We may not understand it at this moment of pain, but it doesn't mean that it is not existent. Don't give up. If we look at 1-7, she departed from the place where she was and her two daughters-in-law with her, and they went on the way to return to the land of Judah. She didn't give up. Well, here I am in Moab. I've lost everyone dear to me. I'm going to go home. She didn't give up. She didn't say, I'm just going to stay here in Moab and, Moab and die. I'm going to go back to the promised land. Maybe, just maybe, something will happen there when I get myself back into the land of promise. Who knows? Um, so she went back home. Um, also, it says here in chapter 2, verse 1, Now Naomi had a kinsman of her husband, a man of great wealth, of the family of Elimelech, whose name was Boaz. That's where Boaz comes in. It says in verse 7, And she said, Please let me glean and gather after the reapers among the sheaves. Thus she came and, she, and, ha, um, and has remained from the morning until now. She has been sitting in the house uh, for a little while. Excuse me. And so here we have where they get back to the promised land. Now what? Now they just sit on their butts and cry about this, the terrible situation out there? No. 
they get up and they start working because there's something to do. You can give up when you're dead, but in the meantime, don't give up. Keep pressing on. And if you look in chapter 3, verse one, verses 1 through 2, Then Naomi, her mother-in-law, said to her, My daughter, shall I not seek security for you that it may be well with you? See, they didn't just live there and eat there. They also, she, Naomi also made plans and continued to do the right thing. <laughs> Naomi said, this is where I am now. What can I do about it? First off, I can get, back, get my butt back to Israel. Second off, we can get up and we can go get some food. Sitting in your house all day, that's a stupid idea. Because, of course, you're going to feel depressed. Go out and live your life. Live it. Never once in the Gospels do you say, and if you've been dealt a terrible blow and Satan has really attacked you, sit around and, and let it stew and just kind of lie on the ground and feel sorry for yourself. No, he said, go into all the world, preach the good news, and, just, and make disciples. Don't stop. You push forward. I know dealing with loss is hard, but it is not the end. The end is when God takes the last of your breath out of your lungs and you get to see him in face to face. That is the end. Nothing before that is the end. And as much as it feels like you can't ever pick yourself up and keep going, you can and you will. Yes, amen. So Naomi said, okay, here we are. They got up, they, they, they picked up food, but then that, that's all they should. She said, okay, now what else can we do? We can resolve this issue. Ruth, you need yourself a man. <laughs> so that's where we get in chapter, chapter 3. And so here we see Naomi not giving up. And then the third thing, wait for God to answer. All these things happen in between chapter 3 and chapter 4, but here we have chapter 4, verse 13. So Boaz took Ruth, and she became his wife, and he went into her. They had sex. And the Lord enabled her to conceive, and she gave birth to a son. Then the woman said to Naomi, Blessed is the Lord who has not left you without a redeemer today, and may his name uh, became, uh, become famous in Israel. May he also be to you a restorer of life and a sustainer of your old age, for your daughter-in-law, who loves you and is better to you than seven sons, has given birth to him. Absolutely. So here we have a few things happening. Chapter 4, verse 13. We see the inheritance restored. And the Lord enabled her to conceive, and she gave birth to a what? A son. What was necessary for the inheritance to be passed down? A son. Daughters are fine, but in Israelite culture, you had to have a son to inherit. So, there's that. She, and she, by, uh, by waiting on God, now we see the inheritance restored. And here's the thing. Even though it was Boaz, Boaz's first son... It was still counted as Ruth's son. So see, what we have here is because Boaz didn't have any other children, Ruth's son would inherit Boaz's land and his name. But he would also inherit Naomi's land because he was the only male living, living male heir of Naomi's side. Yeah. Yep. So not only was he blessed, he was twice blessed. Okay, now, hold on, it gets better. We, look, we spent all that time looking at all those bad things. Let's look at the good sides now. In verse 14, we see her honor is restored. Remember how she was looked down, looked down by, on by everyone? All, all, them, all them girls, they were talking about her behind her back. Ooh, they were talking about her. And then it says in verse 14, Then the women said to Naomi, Now, who, who's the women? That, that's the Facebook messenger, right? That's, that's, the, that's the group that she joined on Facebook. <laughs> the, the group was renamed. It used to be you know, on Facebook, haha, let's point and laugh at Naomi. Now it was changed to, hey, Naomi's the shiz. So here we are in verse 14. Blessed is the Lord who has not left you without a redeemer today, and may his name became, uh, become famous in Israel. May he also be to you a restorer. These are still those women talking. Of life and a sustainer of your old age for your daughter-in-law who loves you and is better to you than seven sons. How many sons did she lose? Two. Now she had a daughter who was better than seven sons. And she also had Boaz as a new, in way, son. Kind of. Sort of. Don't get too carried away with that. I mean, she, she has a new family member. And now she had a new child birthed to Ruth to carry on the inheritance. Um, and is better to you than seven sons has given birth to him. 
And then in verse uh, 16, so we have her honor restored. She's proven as she's righteous. Because for this to happen in her old age was only by the power of God. Yeah. And people knew that. And so now we have her honor restored. We have her inheritance restored. In verse 16, we have a new blessing given. Then Naomi took the child and laid him in her lap and became his nurse. Naomi, who at the beginning of the story had so much and lost so much, here she is at the end, getting it all back and better. Now, it doesn't sound like that's better. Wait, boy, she lost two sons and a husband, and she only got one new child. What's going on here? Boy? Hold on. Verse 17. The neighbor women gave him a name, saying, A son has been born to Naomi. So they named him Obed. Does anybody know what Obed means? Worshipper. Obed means worshiper. Remember how she had spiritual lack at the beginning? Yeah. Now she has spiritual fullness. Wait, it gets better. It says there in, in, going, in the very next uh, sentence, He is the father of Jesse, the father of David. This is the same David who became King David, who God promised to always have an heir on the throne, which if you know anything about history... Jesus was born through the line of David. And so she didn't just get to see a temporary fulfillment of blessings. She saw a long term in King David and an even longer term in Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world. Yes, I think that was better than whatever she had at first. I mean, I could be wrong, but Jesus is the name above every name, so I don't think I am. Um, and so, with that being said, you don't know how the story ends. When you're dealing with loss, you don't know how the story ends. I know that's hard, because death is, is it's all consuming, really, if you think about it. It, 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 it. Death always takes and never seems to give anything back. Mm -hmm. and, and I think, to some degree, spiritual death is a little bit worse than physical death, because as, someone, as long as someone's still alive, they have a chance to turn and, and be saved, but... Spiritual death is so eternal. You know, it's so much worse than just physical death. And so it's not over until God says so. Amen. It's not over until God says so. Amen. When you're dealing with loss, remember that. It's not over until God says so. I've been dealt this terrible blow. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. But it's not over until God says so. And, uh, you know, the, the interesting thing about all this is Ruth never once records a perfect prayer that somebody prayed, right? Mm -hmm. Nowhere in the book of Ruth is there any prayer at all. Right. Now, we know that Ruth and Naomi were praying because of some of the things that happened, some of the things that were said. But it never records any of those prayers. There was no perfect prayer. Furthermore, did you know that it has no perfect speech? No one in the story offers that perfect speech that just gives the hope to power through. This isn't a Shakespeare play. This is real life. You know? And, uh, and nobody, gives that, nobody gives that speech. And yet, we still see Naomi's triumph. And we still see God's salvation. Psalm chapter 37 says this. In verse 25, it says, I have been young, and now I am old. Yet I have not seen the righteous forsaken. Once upon a time I was young, but that, that, that day's gone. But even in my old age, I can stand firm knowing that I have never seen the righteous forsaken. So here we have Naomi and dealing, being dealt huge blows, and we can learn three things. Don't forget or overlook the blessings. Don't give up, but continue to press on and wait for God to answer. So in closing, in closing, I said it. Number one, don't forget what God is doing or what you still have. God is still on the move. But I don't see anything. I didn't ask what you saw. Faith is a, is a, is a substance of things unseen. Yeah, well, okay, that's a little bit different there, isn't it? So it's not over. God, God is still working. And beyond that, we still have things to be thankful for. 
There were times in my life where, honestly, I would just thank God for this. Thank you that I'm still breathing, I guess, but I wish I wasn't. So you get up every day and you, and you keep thanking him for things that you're not really thankful for, and then eventually you start realizing that you do have something to be thankful for. And eventually your, your, your thought process starts changing because you realize they died or you lost, but life goes on. And although you can't imagine life going on without people or things or whatever that, that you're so attached to, life is filled with meetings and partings. And one parting is not the end of your meetings. That make sense? Even when you lose a lot, there is still more that can be gained. Right? Plus, we know that there is no such thing as real death for us believers because we know that there is something greater than anything we could ever have here on earth. So that's good. Ask Billy Graham. Ask Billy Graham. Did you guys know he died this week? <laughs> Crazy, right? Uh, don't give up in life. Don't give up in prayer. Don't give up in faith. If you're struggling, that means you're still in the race. A lot of people say, well, I'm struggling so bad. Listen. Listen. If you're struggling, that means you're still in the race. If it wasn't a struggle to believe in God, if it wasn't a struggle to keep praying, if it wasn't a struggle to keep on growing, that would mean that you've already given up. When you're struggling, count that as a joy. That's a confirmation that you still have at least some faith somewhere hidden away in that dank, dark, depressed place in your heart. There's still some hope left. Every time you struggle in your faith, know that it is God's sign of approval that he is doing something. Right? If you're struggling, that means there's a chance you'll conquer. So then lastly, wait for God to answer. I don't want to under underemphasize that. I want to overemphasize that. Wait for God to answer. What we do is we look at right now, God hasn't answered in the way that I think he should. That means he never will. This is what we should instead say. God does not, right, does not forsake the righteous. I don't know what's going on right now. I don't know what happened back then. I know what will happen. Yeah, I will see the, see the salvation of God. I will. That's all we're, all we're supposed to be steadfast in. All right? So we're going to close there. Can I have the Reverend Randall closes in prayer and then the, 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 the brother Joe pray for the food? Can we do that? It's going to be a split thing. Lord, we thank you for this word tonight, Lord, and pray that you continue to touch us and open our eyes and see things the way you see them. God, we know that you never give up on us, and you are always, always at work. We thank you.